everyone, I'm Karen Foley, and we're here again at the Calabasas Library with our Media Operations Department, and our guest author today, Susanna Abusik. Yep. And Susanna and I have known each other since around 1970, 71, 70, uh, no, 75, 76. Yeah. We met when your husband was a racer for our lakeside races that my husband started that year. And we did it on our own and we were frightened that nobody would come. And I think one of the first guys there was your husband. I think he was a winner, uh -huh. a great, great runner. And then I met you and you told me some of your story and your background and I met your two young daughters. Now your two daughters are going to school and college. They're older and uh, you had discussed you were thinking of writing a book. Then, as the years went on... You kept asking me, where's the book? Where's the book? <laughs> where's the book? And then, then I started Authors Night, well, Susanna, where's the book? And you said you have it, and I received it as a uh, draft, I guess, if your first right, draft. Right. And I said, I'm sorry, but it has to be a published, published thing. And I book. said to myself, I feel so badly. <laughs> and then... You started the publishing process over five years ago. Um, right, yeah, yeah. And it's a long, arduous process. But you per persevered and you actually prevailed. Yeah. And for that, I hold you in such high esteem and have such great <laughs> respect that I'm so pleased to finally see you here today with a very successful, moving novel called... Memory is Our Home, a book of loss and remembering three generations of your Polish family. And it's actually uh, nonfiction. Nonfiction, right. absolutely, based upon your own life and the stories that you heard from your mother. Did you know your grandmother? No, never met. Never, never met. Right. None of the family that my mother left behind they, in Warsaw survived. So she was pretty much the only one to survive. Yeah. I just wanted to. Right. So, but she had your grandmother's story. She remembered so much. When I was growing up in Poland, uh, she was the only one who would tell me those stories. In Poland, under communism, what happened during World War II, none of that was discussed. Uh, so she was the only one who was conveying the stories to me. She was engraving everything on, into my memory. When we moved to America in the late 1960s, my path crossed with Elie Wiesel. And when I started taking his classes and started to read his books, it finally, the kind of jigsaw puzzle that was my life started to fall into place and I finally understood what the stories that my mother was um, telling me during my childhood, what they meant and that the, um, the Holocaust aftermath, uh, how it affected the survivors. So when I told Elie Wiesel about me and my mother, the first thing out of Elie Wiesel's mouth was, your mother must write down the stories. So of course, you know, I was so uh, naive I ran to my mother and I said, well, you know, you must write them down. My mother initially did not want to do it because, uh, you know, what I didn't understand at that time is that it's extremely painful to relive those stories. And if you, and this is in my mother's book, she actually writes about it, how she has to stop at some point because she's crying. Not only that she had to relive the, the hunger and she the pain. She has to live it again. She has to bring her family back to life. The family That's that... better put. Right. So when um, Elie Wiesel, when he walks together with um, Oprah Winfrey, uh, they go back to Auschwitz and the camera rolls for them and he goes, he turns to Oprah Winfrey and he says to her, there are certain places in my mind that I cannot enter for the fear of going mad. And my mother says the same thing when she, um, at the end of the war, she returns from Soviet Russia, from Uzbekistan at that point, and she goes back to Warsaw. You know, at that point when they're living in Uzbekistan, 
they are totally isolated from what's going on in the rest of the world. Um, so she is expecting to find family in Warsaw. And when she comes back, what she comes back to is um, total devastation. She cannot recognize a street, a building. She cannot recognize anything. Not, not just that her family is missing. So she writes about how she, she loses, uh, to quote her, I've lost sa sanity that day in Warsaw. And she feels that the enemy had won. So, you know, it's a similar story. I, I have known and still do know many people who have been survivors and children of those families. And it's always kind of been interesting. I think that's a bad word, but it's a word always provoked my mind as to there's two sets of parents. One who, one set who will not, cannot, do not talk, talk. about anything. Then there is another set that they relive it daily, mm -hmm. reference it. It, it. It's they've never moved beyond it. True, and I had one of each of those parents. I had oh. my father never talked. He built a wall in front of him. He totally detached from the family that he created. That, that is me and my sister. I, everything that I know about my father is what I know through my mother because they spent almost six years throughout Soviet Russia and Uzbekistan. So she knew quite a bit about him and they survived together with only one intent and that is to return home. home to Poland, what they called home, and to their families. So everything I know about him is because what she knew about him, what he told her. But after they came back, he also, he found not, he was actually a sole survivor in his entire family. And he came from Your Łódź, father? my father. Uh, nobody survived. And I actually was able to later on when, um, and uh, when all of the information started becoming more and more available, I found his mother and his father and his sister um, on a transport to Auschwitz. And one sister who was 30 years old uh, died of starvation in the Wood ghetto. So, you know, the, he didn't know about it. He, when, he died when I was 10. So that's another sad story. <laughs> but um, uh, he never talked. And studies have shown that you're absolutely right. There were two kinds of sur uh, parents, if you will, among survivors, those who totally uh, uh, became silent and those who could not stop talking. I think those who did not stop talking were simply trying to give voice to the generation of that course, was silenced. As well, voice should be given. Yeah. But tell me, say, what about your husband's family? You know, uh, and he's also a child of um, survivors. His father was like my father. He was the only one who survived. And his, fa his father was also silent. Uh, he never talked. His mother's family, on the other hand, they survived rather well. They survived as a whole family. And their attitude was very different. Um, his mother uh, lost a husband, but that's because he was a soldier. He went to the war and uh, a brother because he was a soldier and went to the war. But otherwise, the family survived uh, as a whole with parents and grandparents and so on. But what about you and Barry? How, what, what parents are you? Do you discuss, discuss <laughs> everything that went Good. on? You or do you wait to be asked? You're forthcoming, I know. You as a person, you will answer questions directly. Right. Well, you know, because I was so traumatized as a child, uh, when we had our children, our two daughters, uh, they knew everything about Poland and our heritage, but only about the, the great things. They knew about art and music, about films and about uh, theater. But when they turned... Uh, 18 and 20, it's when I, 
I you waited that long. I waited well, they that could long. approach it intellectually as well as emotionally at that age. Yeah, because they had probably done a lot of reading. Well, you know, luckily we live in California, and I only lived in New York State and California. Uh, we have Holocaust education at uh, K through 12, uh, mandatory, meaning that there is money uh, that is uh, uh, mandated to teach, to well, to train teachers and to have tools. Uh, 44 states do not. So I didn't know about it, believe it or not. So, um, so they did learn, I, you know, uh, they, they knew a little bit, but they really know uh, Time. They they know they know very little. It's just through history. Uh, but I insisted on taking them on a like a heritage Jewish heritage oh, of, of Poland because you know you know that in Poland uh, Jews have uh, almost a thousand year old history. I've been there. So the history goes on. Yeah, in many yeah. instances. And it was wiped out in six short years. And uh, the last hundred years especially is very interesting because Poland, the second Polish Republic, was born um, with the Versailles Treaty because it was before that uh, Poland was occupied for a hundred years by its neighbors, was divided up by Russia, Prussia and the Austro-Hungarian Empire. So um, after that, uh, at the end of World War I, Poland was born as the Second Polish Republic. And with that, it brought a lot of patriotism. So my mother went to regular public school, so did I. And we were, although we were Jewish, we still were very patriotic. You know, we, we grew up with a lot of patriotism to the Polish Republic. Well, basically, I don't like to use filler words. Judge Judy doesn't use filler words. <laughs> but the Poles have had a tumultuous history. Yes. Their borders have changed and interchanged. Yes. I think my father was from, and even with Russia, my father was from Minsk or Pinsk. Yeah. Couldn't remember, and from time to time, well, part of Russia, part of Poland, part of who knows what else. Yeah, it was constantly changing. Constantly yeah. changing, but that part of the world i am only been back to as a visitor, and that was difficult enough. Yeah, no well, you see, for me, it's a little different. I've been back many times. I, uh, I always use that um, uh, sentence that I always have been chasing after two worlds. I've been chasing after yes. my homeland. See, I've got that in my notes. I'm <laughs> glad you brought it up, and, yes. You know, and I'm chasing after my home, adopted home. Um, and and it's um, and I always think of Czesław Miłosz, who who was a Polish uh, um, writer yeah. and a poet, and yes. he and he had to right in 1951 work. he had to leave Poland because the communists did not like his uh, writing, and he had to flee Poland. He he became actually a professor at Berkeley, but when communism fell he was able to return to Poland. Yet for us, there, being Jewish, Polish Jewish, there are too many scars, too many lingering scars. So kind of feel homeless. <laughs> well, let's take a breath from the home at the moment and the homelessness and our book and take a short break. Okay. I'm gonna have to compose myself. I'm becoming very emotional. And audience, stay with us for our second segment. Thank you very much. Where is this guy? So thirsty. I hear he travels from the north. Look! <laughs> LA is in a drought, yet over half of our drinking water is being used for landscaping. But it doesn't have to be that way. 
Just one inch of rain can yield thousands of gallons of water for use in landscaping and saves drinking water for drinking. Rain barrels, cisterns, and curb cuts are just a few ways to save water and energy. For more, visit LADWP and the Bay Foundation online. Karen Foley, Author's Night, Memory is Our Home by Susanna A. Busick. Yeah. And I was discussing with her before, while we were, you guys were taking a break from us. Why do you think these stories need to be told? Well, there's so many reasons, but one of the most important reasons, you know, is that very soon we're going to hear that uh, the survivors are no longer with us. Second generation, which is me, are pretty much following in, in the survivors' footsteps. History is very important, and history gives us power, and we need to connect history to the present. And I think future generations will make, um, you know, will make this relevant, and they need to make relevant, because we cannot uh, be, we cannot rewrite or whitewash history. But it's done all the time. History is written by the winners. The educational system writes it almost objectively from a great distance. Religious texts, one's philosophies change within the religion, the old texts are thrown away. So for a person who was there, or heard from a person who lived the experience and took the time to write it down, that's the history that's important. Right, and you know what I actually did with my book, I took it a step further, because what I, the one thing I noticed in my mother's journals is that she also uh, wrote about history. So what I, the first thing I did, I started to research those historical facts. So I think memoirs are living documents told by real people. That's to me, is the real history by right. real people. And on top of it, you, when we connect them to historical facts, I think this is, for us, history books don't, cannot teach any of that. I think that's why we need to um, connect them to when we teach history. And one of the best examples for me is in Calabasas High School. I remember when my daughters were learning about the plight of the Chinese people, they were using um, a real book about real people, uh, yes. uh, and that book was called, I think, A Thousand Pieces of Gold. And I thought, oh my God, this is my mother's story. I mean, it's a, it's a different people, different culture, but this is exactly the same thing. And I think when you using a human, um, a human uh, type of a story, people can learn on a, such a different level. And we were worth one kilo of sugar. Yeah. That's what people sold us for. Yeah, or, or, the, or, or if not even less than that. Yeah, absolutely. And what was so poignant to me is that reading your story, I juxtapositioned myself in that era. What you were doing, what your mother was doing, at the time when I was alive. And when you say your relatives starved to death, when I would sit down and I wouldn't eat the food, now I would be hit with the Jews in Europe, everybody in Europe, all the refugees in Europe, they're starving. Everyone in Europe is starving and you're complaining. And the fact that we didn't have butter and put the yellow coloring in the oleo margarine to whip it up to make it look <laughs> like butter, we had something. Yeah. The people in Europe, all of the people yeah. in and Europe had nothing. Right. And you know, also we're learning. I mean, history is here so that we can learn from, from it. It's, you know, there is, otherwise why even bother you know, having history as a subject. 
So we need to make it relevant. We need to bring it into the present. And I see people selling cookies and see people selling candy, youth groups to raise money. And we had a drive in City Hall. I went through everybody's closet at home, anything that anybody wasn't wearing for warmth for people and donated money. it. And yet during your mother's era, we were knitting blankets, knitting squares, and all the squares would be put together into a quilt mm. for the British. Mm. Or we would be sending Red Cross boxes for people who had nothing mm. in Europe. My mother writes how in Russia they were, they were starving and they were trying to send um, boxes of food back to Warsaw or Wuj, and she never knew if, if, if they ever got there, but to, they tried. In this day and age, they don't get there many times. My <laughs> son, who works for non-government organizations like uh, the UN and Care Concern and all these other countries, uh, he's part of a movement to help now do our aid that we give in times of drought, famine, floods, hunger, aid in the form of cash. Because you send what you, you send, don't. sometimes is never received. Mm, that's interesting. Or it's what they don't need. Mm. So if you give the cash, then you know it arrives to the person who picks it up. They keep their dignity. Yeah. And yet they can do for the families. But you're right, we never knew if anybody received these things. Yeah. Well, th in that sense, things did change from the way things were. But, you know, history, I think, is very important, and I think we need to study it so we can learn from it. And Why memoirs. Why do the survivors want to record it? Do they. Well, you know, there's they, many reasons. The Shoah Foundation. I think there's many reasons. I think for a lot of them is to tell. Uh, to tell us how they survived, to contemplate on uh, surviving death, and you, you know, how do you live? How do you how do you go on? Uh, it's a it's a process of healing, I was, a catharsis. Yeah, yeah, and but also to tell the next generation what it is that they lived through, and to prove this situation, this Holocaust really did occur. Yeah, and, and also to speak for the for all of those who have no voice. Who have no voice who were murdered. Because you know, this is not just that they died, they were murdered. And nobody's hands are clean. No, in this case actually nobody. Uh, American you, corporations. Yeah, and if European you know corporations. Yeah, and there is a film, uh it's called uh The Long Way Home. And what happened to the actually at the end of the war, the survivors uh were kept for three or so years in the they call them DP camps, but those were pretty much the um um they look like concentration camps. Nobody, the world didn't want them. Nobody wanted them. Yeah. In fact, when going back to their own country, to their own home, they were murdered. Yeah. They were murdered. Yeah. Yes. The, well, the big pogrom in Kelce, right? And that was not during the war. This was after the war, when the first survivors uh, went back to their homes. Uh, the Polish people were outraged to see them alive because they were re returning, you know, to their villages or their home, their cities. And uh, there was a huge pogrom in Kelce. I think, I believe there were over 60 uh, residents that were murdered. So people were afraid to go back and they were murdered. Um, the original few that were murdered, I think, I forgot what village, they found them with um, little notes in their pockets. This is what's gonna happen anyone who returns, you know, don't come back, basically. Um, and also, during the war, there is this big um, controversy, because the Polish uh, 
people refuse to accept responsibility, they blaming it on the German. But everyone knows now because of the evidence that it was the Polish uh, neighbors who burned their their Jewish neighbors, and that's the village of Jedwabne. And now they know we know through evidence that there were a few other villages. They basically uh, killed their own neighbors. And that kind of takes us back to uh, what my mother was uh, talking about when she was uh, a young girl, really, because she was 16, 17, 18. By the time the war broke out, she was 22. But when she was fighting, uh, you know, she felt very Polish. She was Jewish. Her religion was Jewish, but she was very Polish. And the Bund movement um, worked very hard to fight for justice for all. They were, uh, it was a socialist movement. They were not interested in overthrowing the government and they were legal. They were not uh, communists. Communism in Poland was they tried illegal. They it seem as if they were the outsider. The people who were against this movement, they were be very disparaging. Mm -hmm. But they were, it was legal. It was, yes, it was. Yeah, it, it was, was legal. a legal entity. But they were basically fighting for the rights for the, of the workers. You know, in Poland, um, workers at that time uh, had zero rights. Uh, well, they were the underdogs. Yeah. Well, I think it's fair to say that the workers, as the victims of this Holocaust, were beyond the Jews, beyond just a Jewish situation. It was anyone who was not Aryan or full Polish. It was against the communists. It was against the feeble-minded, as they called them there, as we would now know that are just challenged either emotionally, mentally, or physically. Well, yeah, well, Hitler, but, yeah. Homosexuality. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, a political position. If yeah. you were outspoken, you were declared a political yeah. prisoner. Well, that's what because you were an upstart and detrimental to their government. Right, a heretic. Yeah, well, Stalin did the same thing. You know, yes. Castro's Cuba did the same thing. If you know, if he fears anyone, they fear they and they get rid of. And it was more than just Jews who were killed. Yeah, but uh, Hitler especially. You know, wanted well, to. Well, that was his program. Right, right, yeah. But, you know, but going back to the Bund, uh, they fought for, for rights for all workers, not just for Jewish workers. That is, you yeah. know, so, and it thinks, but, and my mother writes about how she felt um, that there were things were not, she was already sensing that things were not quite right. Um, what she called uh, a puzzle. She was sensing a puzzle. And um, Dennis Klein, Professor Dennis Klein, he's the one who wrote about, um, uh, he wrote the forward to my book. And he wrote, I think you were going to ask me that question in a little while, um, uh, how he writes about when he was doing research of um, Holocaust survivors' memoirs, he found a common thread, and he felt that uh, the commonality throughout the different uh, memoirs was one thing. And one thing they all had in common was that uh, the Jewish Polish citizens were um, uh, thrown under the bus pretty much by their Polish neighbors. And yes, my indeed. mother writes. There's no denying yeah, that. And my mother writes about the same thing. She called it a puzzle. She says that she was sensing a puzzle. She, she, um, because she was a Bundist and she fought for, you know, she was she felt very Polish, and she says something was not quite right, and the. Um, the changes were slow. You had the depression, the Great Depression, that affected everybody, and she felt it was affecting the Polish uh, Jewish uh, workers even more so, uh, because um, you had uh, the Jewish students were right away uh, affected by the sc in the school system. Uh, you had Jewish shops were boycotted. Uh, you had um, 
doctors and uh, lawyers. You had the Aryan quarters. I mean, in Poland, yeah. it started happening pretty quickly, even before any, you know, before uh, any German soldiers entered Poland. Uh, after Pilsudski had died, uh, already anti-Semitism was out in the open. So, you know, things were gradually snowballing in Poland before the Nazi invasion. I would ask that you stay with me for a final segment of Memoirs Are Home and Susanna Ibusik. Let's just give a few minutes and we will be back. Thank you. Again? Hey, Dad. Dad. There are other ways of saving money and energy around your house. Did you know that LADWP is now offering cash rebates for you to retrofit your home to be more energy and water efficient? It's good for California, and it's good for Dad. Let's make California a better place to live, starting with our homes. To get your rebates, go to www.ladwp.com slash save. Author's Night is back for our last segment with Susanna Ebusik. Mm -hmm. And I want to ask you, you mentioned about always tracing your two worlds and the effort you've made to get this story told to everyone and your remarkable endeavor and success in getting it published. When you wrote this book, other than as a beautiful gift to the family and to the Jewish people as a whole. How would you like to see this book used and directed toward what group of people, what age group, and for what purpose? Well, you know, because the book has so much, um, I researched so much history, so it's not just, um, it's not just a memoir told by real people. There is a lot of historical facts in there. Uh, the book can definitely be used as a tool at the high school level. Um, college level and as well as you know beyond uh, but definitely as part of um, you know history at the high school level. Well a wonderful opportunity for you to have this book and some of the people you've met like Weissel and all the professors you've really met some exemplary educators and without them, I don't know how I would have uh, persevered for the last six years. And when Wiesel first told me, don't be afraid of the journey ahead, I actually had no idea what he was talking about, but I certainly understand now. <laughs> well, the journey takes you to all these different countries, Russia, and you get a real feel of the real Russian. When you read your book, you say, oh, wow. You know, and the story what happened in Russia uh, for the refugees uh, is really very little known, if, if at all. And also how they survived throughout Russia and Uzbekistan. For the Jewish people throughout Russia and Uzbekistan, um, they, um, they truly survived. You know, they, I mean, the survival was, um, you know, they barely survived. They starved, uh, they were exposed to elements, they were exposed to malaria. Um, you know, starvation, but, but they were never afraid of being Jewish, Jews. So there is that little distinction. They were afraid of being in Russia. Yes, but they were never afraid of, of but being... But it, it was not their religion that caused right, them Right, exactly, right. I re well, my own family escaped from that part of the world because they ran away from being conscripted, conscripted into the Russian army. Right. They knew that would have killed them immediately. Yeah. 
But you know, at the very beginning of the second part of the book deals only with the uh, surviving uh, like 40 years uh, throughout Russia and Uzbekistan. At the very beginning of the book, my mother's life is saved by a Russian soldier. Now, can you imagine if this was uh, a German soldier? Well, that would have been a bullet in her head. I've been just reading lots of articles lately in the New York Times, and it indicates that I'm capsulizing this in my own viewpoint, my point of view rather from what I'm reading, that individuals may be a more compassionate person, I, yeah, an but individual, the but when you get the yeah. mob mentality yeah. and the support and fervor yeah. of a group, it becomes ugly, nasty, yeah. deadly. Well, the, the Germans, the Nazis, when they entered Poland, they were, they were vicious. They killed, and my mother describes, they killed for no reason whatsoever. Wasn't there a, a group of horsemen, the last of the Polish warriors, that set out the last to face the Germans and certain death for all of them. But that was a, a courageous act, but they did it for the Poles generally, not for a particular yeah. group. Well, you know, like Stalin was extremely vicious to the, to the Polish people. To everybody. Yeah, he tried to wipe out the Polish identity on the yes. in the territories that he uh, occupied the Eastern Polish territories because he, he wanted to wipe out the Polish identity. But he never um, so much as to try to wipe out the Jews per se, the way Hitler went it? after. Universal murderer. I mean, they both are evil. But my, I, all I can say, my mother always made sure that I remember, she would always say my life was saved in Russia. Everybody else who stayed in Poland died at the hands of Hitler. You know, she never actually used it, you know, the word, you know, the hands of Germany or German people. She always said Hitler. She always made that slight little distinction. So. I know when I first got your bound copy and your published copy, I said, well, I've read the, the original narrative. Uh, I can just skim it. But I read every word <laughs> twice. And I was mesmerized. I, it held me captive. I was in the thrall of your words because I heard of all these things. And it's been many years since I've spoken with someone who was personally so involved. Many years. Yeah. I'll never forget it, but it brought it all home to me again. Now, I know our library has the copy of this right. book, and the Savvy Seniors are being given a copy of, the, of our book for their reading room. How can somebody contact you and to learn more about you as a person, more about your work, or, and how get a copy of your book? Okay, the book is available on, on Amazon. Uh, it's distributed by Columbia University Press here uh, in, Amer in the US. Uh, but I, man, I have been maintaining a website, so it's www.memoryisourhome.com. Uh, we'll put it on the screen. Um, I, um, I have updated as often, you know, as something new is happening. Uh, so all the new information, like the different libraries that carry the book uh, throughout the world, not just the U.S. Um, uh, my email is available there. I'm available for uh, Calabasas and Agora High School if they'd like to invite me to talk. I just came back from a wonderful talk at uh, Las Vegas uh, that I was invited to, uh, to a wonderful turnout. I gave a, uh, I think it was a great presentation. I, I was happy with it. <laughs> if Calabasas or Agora High School are interested to invite me to their history or literature Don't class. Don't viewpoint. Viewpoint? Oh, okay. Yes. Oh, I didn't think about it. <laughs> but yeah. uh, sure, I'll definitely make a mental note of that. Yeah. But my email is available. On, inside my um, website, there is embedded a YouTube video that actually there is a third generation a grandchild of Holocaust survivors. He reads uh, a few excerpts from the book. Um, 
this, this was one of the first things that I did um, when I embarked on my, um, on my mission. And um, so, yeah, it, everything is available and people are welcome to contact me. But the book is available on Amazon. Well, I want to thank you so very much for sticking with me all of these years, not giving up and knowing that I can be taken at my word when I said to you, well, thank publish you. it, we'll do it, please do it. Well, thank you for putting me in your queue the minute I told you it was published. <sighs> and so. I hope that it brought some peace for your mother. I know people always say, well, things like this can bring closure. Well, I don't know if there is a closure in life. Your memories stay with you. And the word peace and comfort and maybe being able to put something behind you and give you strength to go forward is better than closure anyway. And to me, that kind of sum, what sums it all, and oh, I found most beautiful and glad to see that in your book, as one of the lead pages, the prefaces to your story, a quote by William Faulkner that expresses it better than <laughs> my mumbling words can, the past is, is never dead. Yeah. The past is not past. And that's why to me it's so important that future generations uh, don't make it irrelevant, that they make it relevant, that they don't forget, that they uh, incorporate into whatever it is that they're doing, that they into their history, into their uh, literature. Uh, those are real stories. They're real documents. Uh, about uh, real people, real communities, real culture. Uh, a culture that, it, for Poland especially, was totally decimated. Thank you ag again for today. Thank you for having me. I, uh, it really means a lot to me, you know that. And to give my, my best to your family. It's been a long while since I've seen him. I see your husband on 4th of July yeah. for the race is still. <laughs> I, I gave up I don't on see that. your children. <laughs> and sometimes I'm pleased to see you. Yeah. And thank, you. thank you again for being here and being very direct and providing a wonderful memorable experience. Thank well, you. Well, thank you so much. You know that. It means thank a lot you, to me. Media Operations Department, City of Calabasas, and of course our Calabasas Library, and you, our audience for Authors' Night.